and war of course the initials for the racing team walt austin racing now it's to the pro stocks round two vince curry against paul ravashi a pro stock is basically a very highly modified late model detroit stock car 2350 pounds 500 cubic inch engines four and five speed trans carburetors with gasoline in the number 16 qualified spot was this guy, Paul Rabeshi, who upset Warren Johnson in round one. It helped that Johnson broke. Vince Curry, well, he had a legitimate upset. He qualified number nine and blew away Frank Iaconio, one of the strong names from New Jersey, in round number one. Now, the staging process, very important for these cars, Don Garlitz. Yes, because they put the engine at such a high RPM to leave, it's very important that that front wheel be in exactly the right position, or they'll red light. A real challenge to drive one of these cars, to keep it straight and to make the gear changes within about three quarters of a second of each other. Listen to the RPM. Rabeshi leaves too soon. A red light, a foul start, call it what you will, it means automatic disqualification. The winner, Vince Curry, just shuts it off, probably in shock over his tremendous success in the early going at the U.S. Nationals. Be right back as we continue from Indianapolis. Welcome back once again to Indianapolis Raceway Park. I'm Joel Myers, along with Steve Evans and Big Daddy Don Garlands. As we continue with the U.S. Nationals, a great crowd on hand on a beautiful weekend. And they're working right now in the pit area of Kenny Bernstein as they get ready for their semifinal matchup in the top fuel division with Frank Hawley. But first, it's the Pro Stock Division, round number two, Scott Jeffreyon and Bruce Allen. A pair of General Motors products going head-to-head -head here. Uh, Scott Jeffreyon runs on the Warren Johnson team. We mentioned earlier Warren Johnson, the low qualifier. He was dropped in the opening round, so all of their hopes now ride with Jeffrey on. Bruce Allen, the yellow car from Arlington, Texas, they have had their best outing in a long, long time. In fact, Allen qualified number three at a 732 and beat Ricky Smith. Jeffrey on qualified only 11th at a 736, but has since picked up on that performance as Butch Leal found out in round number one when Jeffrey on sent him home. Again, they're pre-stage. That's the top yellow lights as they inch forward to complete the staging process. 1,320 feet away from the finish line. We've got a race. Bruce Allen is slowing. He had a tremendous lead over very late Scott Jeffrey on. Jeffrey on tremendous elapsed time. 731, 190 miles per hour. But he better sharpen up his reaction times in the round to come or he'll be out of here. And here is Mark Powick as he gets ready for his race against Larry Morgan, a veteran who has won this race before, Steve, back in 89. He has, and he was runner-up here as well to Jerry Ekman, last year's champion. I call Morgan Mr. Happy because in 90% of the winning interviews I've ever done with him, he always starts off with, I'm so happy. Well, let's hope he has a chance to say that again for Oldsmobile's sake. Well, as I look again, actually, these are both Oldsmobile cars, so that division of General Motors can't lose this one. There is no tougher pro category in drag racing just to qualify for than pro stock. Larry Morgan made the field in the number four position at 733 and beat Jerry Haas with a brand new car in round number one. Mark Powick qualified number five at 734, so they're only one position apart. If Desire could win drag races, Mark Powick would win them all. He is just so hungry and he's come so close. But you know, Larry Morgan ran a 727 in round one and Powick only had a 731. That's light years in pro stock racing, and you're only as good as your last run in drag racing. Absolutely. You can throw out those qualifying numbers. They mean nothing. It's another day, another track, a different set of atmospheric conditions. You see Morgan moving in. Now Powick, last to stage. Good start by both drivers. Good drag race. But it is Morgan in the far lane at a 729. Nice consistency. 189 miles per hour to Mark Powick, 735. A car length and a little bit more. We move back to the pit area now of Jim White's car as he's getting ready for his semifinal matchup with Mark Oswald. Well, they've got the car running, so obviously they've repaired it, but do they have the parts that are comparable to what they were using earlier to put together those incredible times as he had a 521 in round two? Let's check in now with Steve Evans once again. Well, Larry Morgan is Mr. Happy, but this might make him ecstatic in the hottest part of the day, a 729. <laughs> I'm pretty happy about that. I'm, I'm happy for my sponsors and everybody here. I think it's my race, buddy. You've won it before. So true to form, Larry Morgan is happy. And now one of the most interesting confrontations in the pro stock division, Bob Glidden, who has won this race 10 times, up against Daryl Alderman. If you could book these two in for a three out of five match race, you could fill any local drag strip in the United States. That's how popular these two guys in Pro Stock are. 
Nobody will argue. You can call Bob Glidden Mr. Pro Stock in his Ford Pro. Be qualified number seven. Slow for him at 735. Beat defending champ Ekman in round one. Alderman qualified number two. No surprise. 7.30, he beat Jerry Yeoman in round number one, and you're on board the Dodge Daytona with Daryl Alderman, the defending Winston Pro Stock champion, and he has such a points lead, no one is betting against him, repeating in 1991. Near lane is the Dodge, far lane the Ford Pro, Glidden Alderman, maybe the two best in Pro Stock racing. Watch his right hand. One of the few drivers still with a four-speed transmission, but Alderman pulls it off over Glidden. 7.30 to a 7.38, 189 miles per hour to 188 miles per hour. The winning difference, nine hundredths of a second. So the semifinals are set now in the Pro Stock Division as well. Scott Jeffreyon going up against Daryl Alderman. Alderman will have the lane choice in that matchup. And the second pairing, it'll be Vince Curry against Larry Morgan and Morgan will have the option there in lane choice. Back to the pit area, John Force's car being pushed out, getting ready for his semifinal race against Dell Warship. We will be watching that when we return to Indianapolis Raceway Park. Welcome back once again to Indianapolis. Tom, the Mongoose McCune getting ready for his semifinal. Even though he really hasn't made a good run so far today, he'll have his hands full with the rookie, Pat Austin, in the top fuel semis. Right now, it's the semis of the funny cars, though Jim White against Mark Oswald, and Steve will find out a lot more, possibly, about Jim White's car. Well, along with Pat Austin, certainly Jim White has been the big story of the U.S. Nationals. And let's not underestimate Mark Oswald in that red and white car. They have consistently been in the low to mid 530s, and those are competitive elapsed times. But I want to say something here. I don't care what Jim White said in the open about we got a lot of parts, everything's just fine. I watched the cylinder heads. They took off the car. They hid them in the trailer, the ones they put on for this round. Any spectator could have taken a picture of. So they are not operating with the same speed secrets, Don Garland. But Steve, they wanted Mark Oswald to think they were so that he would lean on, and he did. He gave it too much clutch. He smoked the tires. The Hawaiian takes a win, but something goes wrong with the Hawaiian car. No question, 578, 191, that's slow for that team. And they take no prisoners. They run all out all the time. In the other semifinal pairing, John Force and Del Worsham. In the four previous meetings between these two teams, even though Worsham has won two national events this year, Force has taken all four over Dell. And John Force makes his traditional long half-track smoky burnout. But look, there's Dale Warsham completely out in front of Force. He's making a statement to him. He's saying, look, here I am. Are you ready? Well, we saw at the tail end of Jim White's win that they had problems at the end of that race. Let's find out more now down the road with Steve. For years, we talked about the lack of racing luck for Jim White. Well, buddy, you just got a big dose of it. Big dose of it that time. Uh, something broke in the drive line on this car. I heard the motor come way up. Yeah, it's probably the rear end, uh, maybe the reverse or something, the reverser, but uh, we've got parts. We'll fix it. Okay. What about the engine? Can you go back to a combination you had before? Yeah, the engine was just fine. Boy, that Jim White's playing those cards close to his chest. Just exactly what I'd be doing. Dell Warsham ready for the semifinal against John Force. Those mind games we saw just a little bit earlier. And you know, there is a Rookie of the Year award at the end of the season. And if Dell Warsham doesn't win it, I'll be absolutely shocked. 21 years of age, unsponsored, the family car from Southern California, up against, and you're riding with the biggest name in funny car racing the past two years, John Brute Forrest. He doesn't see Worsham, and there's a reason for that. Worsham has shut it off. Forrest, a nice, solid, safe 538 at 272 miles per hour. Let's take another look, and let's see if we can see what happened to Dale Worsham. We see that they take a very nice, even start. Both cars move almost identically. And then as they move off the starting line, we see that Dale Warsham starts to have a little bit of trouble. He smokes the tires, lifts, gets back on it, the wheels go up. That's the end of the deal. Force is the winner. So the pairing is set now for the funny car final. The two top runners going head to head. Jim White against John Force. And let's join Steve now with John. John, was that you pedaling the throttle or Dale Warsham? It was hard to tell from down here. It was some uh, trouble out there. How'd she run? 538. 538. Uh, she slowed down, obviously. Uh, track's going away. And I told Coyle when, 
when he come up to the car, she was too grill. I said, you pumped her up because we're rolling and we don't need it now. And and uh, I told him, I was looking at her, we're driving, we're driving. He's looking at me. I said, we're driving, we're driving it because she wouldn't hold it. She went out and she pedaled her a little bit and she flew down through there, just what we planned on. All this clutch dust on the fire suit. She was it. clutching. This whole heap was hunting and she was clutching and blacking. And my God, I need a brand new one. <laughs> That's kind of his trademark, you know, the dirty fire suit. Safe to say John Force a little pumped up. But concern again for car owner Jack Clark. Can he get a good run out of his car and driver Tom McEwen in the top fuel semifinal against Pat Austin? Well, not only is Jack and McEwen up against Lee Beard and the natural Pat Austin, tremendous frustration. They came in here last Thursday, fired off a 506 and said, take that. Now we'll go quicker and quicker and quicker. They haven't. They've gone slower and slower and slower. And the crew on that car really doesn't know why. They're searching. They're trying for any kind of a miracle that'll give them the combination to beat Pat Austin. Austin, recall, in round number one, had one of the best reaction times Don Garland said he had ever seen. Austin near lane. He's got the lane choice, and he's selected the right side of your screen as you look head on. Another great start by Austin. Can McEwen contend with it? No, he cannot. 503, 281. Remember, four hundreds is a perfect light. There was another 4 1. Just incredible for a rookie, especially. Well, that young man, Pat Austin, has that top fuel pitch just buzzing. Man, back in the pit area for the Pro Stocks, we're looking around the car of Daryl Alderman. He has just beaten Bob Glidden to make it to the semifinals. He'll face Scott Jeffrey on. He has been a dominant force in the Pro Stocks, but let's not forget he's never won this race. Let's check in with Steve now. Pat Austin, his debut as a top fuel driver. You just threw out Jack Clark's car at third base with a 503. This is a, this is a story that's going to continue for one more round this field car, and we're going to get in the winner circle. Your reaction times are sensational. Everybody's talking about them. They can't even believe them. Well, an object to, it's just like a fight. It's obvious to a boxing match. You go in there and you establish your ground rules right away, and that's to let them know that you're there for business and nothing else. So I think you like to throw the right hook and hit him on the chin and let him know that you can throw a good hook. Well, you got him on the mat so far. One more round to go. Rock and roll. He's rocked and rolled his way to the finals. The next semifinal, up next, Kenny Bernstein and Frank Hawley. We're in the pit area with the defending season-long champion, John Force. He gets ready for the funny car final that everybody was hoping for, going up against Jim White. Let's go to the opposite end of the track now with Steve Evans. Play this car just keeps running better and better, and uh, Pat is a natural in it, apparently. Oh, he's doing a super job. He's like the Airtron Santa drag racing, you know. <laughs> I'm uh, awful lucky to be in this position to have such a good driver here at the U.S. Nationals. And I think you'll even be more impressed when you see that reaction time. Oh, we've been watching him all through qualifying and elimination series. Phenomenal. The biggest difference, though, between Pat Austin and Formula One great Ayrton Senna is that Austin doesn't make $15 million a year. We'll find out now who will face Pat Austin in the top fuel final. Kenny Bernstein going up against Frank Hawley and Don. Kenny Bernstein, a very good one working the tree. Yes, he is, and there's a lot of pressure on Bernstein because he's number two in the points, and he needs to go as far as he can go if he's going to catch that gap and fill it up between him and Amato. And there's Amato. He's concerned, too. He wants Bernstein out of this race right now. Oh, he is rooting big time for Frank. Oh, you can see him right there. Come on, Hawley. Stop this man. I could feel his hot breath on the back of my neck in this points chase. Holly, the bright blue car, owned by Daryl Gwynn. Right-hand lane, Kenny Berenstain. Oh, buddy. Oh, what a great drag race. But you see by Dale Armstrong's reaction, who won it? Kenny Berenstain with a starting line advantage. 507 defeats a 504. Here we see Bernstein take the advantage immediately. It wasn't very much, but it was enough to overcome the better ET that the Holly car turned. As he moved down course, Frank Holly does try to make up the difference. He did have the quicker car, but there just wasn't enough racetrack left to do it. Bernstein gets there first. We're down to the final now in the top fuels as well. Pat Austin, the rookie, going up against the Wiley veteran Kenny Bernstein, who's with Steve Evans right now. Final round against Pat Austin. It will be a battle of the levers. Yeah, it will. He's leaving awful good, too. Of course, he's got so much adrenaline going, Steve. First top fuel in the finals. I mean, you couldn't get him off the moon right now, I'm sure. So it's going to be tough up there. We've got to find a little performance. We're just off a taste, and we just got to keep after it. Frank and those guys did a great job. You bet.